Welcome to The Escape Artist, Financial Freedom by Design. Bonnie, thank you and welcome to the podcast. Thank you for your time. Hi there. If it's okay to introduce yourself, just give an overview to who you are and also your story in terms of financial independence. So I'm Barney, Barney Whiter. I write a blog called The Escape Artist. I've been writing that for about six years now. And that blog is about, well, lots of different things. It's, it's about how to get better with money. It's about kind of self-development and it's about how to get to financial freedom. Writing that over the last five or six years, I've kind of drawn on my, my backstory and my career. And my backstory was that kind of growing up, um, my parents, they borrowed quite a lot of money, had a big mortgage. And in 1981, interest rates went to 17 percent and our family had a little mini kind of what felt like a mini financial crisis at the time i kind of with hindsight you know nothing bad happened we didn't get um repossessed by the bank or anything but um you know my dad kind of stopped brewing his own beer sorry he stopped buying beer and started brewing his own the newspaper got cancelled the holiday got cancelled and i think i took from that period the uh the, the kind of understanding that debt was a scary thing and that owing money to the bank was a scary thing and so I growing up was I lived in the absolute back end of nowhere uh, in rural East Anglia and at that time you know the city was being deregulated this was the 80s I was kind of seeing lots of pictures of stockbrokers with these big chunky phones and champagne on the on the news and thought oh you know for someone that has this kind of fear of poverty for someone that that sees the glamour of that wealth that looks like an interesting you know finance looks like an interesting road to go down so i when i went to university i did economics i then trained as a chartered accountant and then when i'd qualified i went and worked in corporate finance i ended up specializing in the valuation of companies and also mergers and acquisitions kind of advising on people buying and selling companies and uh, I kind of did that for 20 years um, for different employers you know some were good jobs um, some and I enjoyed some I hated and while experiencing the ones that I hated it really reinforced my motivation to kind of stash enough money to have options to change my um, situation so you know, initially, uh, all I wanted to do was get out of debt. I got a mortgage when I was 26 and cleared it by the time I was 32. So I was debt free at that point. And I just wanted to build up a kind of career retraining fund because I kind of was thinking I might have to retrain as something else, go off and do something completely different. So I just wanted to build up money to fund that, given that my wife had stopped working and we had kids, we ended up having three kids. So I needed Um, a pot of money to or I thought I needed a pot of money to kind of fund transfer from a a job that I was in uh, and potentially to change career what actually happened was that I changed job but not career so I did I actually considered going off to become a secondary school teacher kind of teaching like business and economics at a normal kind of school Um, but I didn't do that what I did is I got a I got a better job in finance and ended up kind of doubling down on on my corporate finance career. But what I did was I said, okay, I'm going to earn I'm earning good money. So what I'm going to do is hang on to at least fifty percent of everything I earn in terms of salary and any bonuses that I get. That will also go into my freedom fund. And essentially, I did that for a few more years. And then I got to the happy point in 2013, when I realized that I had enough not to do that anymore. Can you talk people through the maths behind this in terms of saving bait versus what pot they might need? Yes. So the way the maths works is that you kind of have enough when you have 25 times your annual spending i mean you have enough theoretically never to work again and your money never run out if you have invested net worth 
of 25 times your annual spending. So there's two ways you can kind of do that. You can make your spending really low and that, that makes it kind of, you can kind of uh, get, to, get there via frugality or you can earn more money, kind of stash more away or some combination of the two, obviously. Um, but the basic maths are you need 25 times your annual spending. Um, and the way that the maths works is that it, at a 50% savings rate, it takes about 18 years to go from broke to financially uh, independent. And what's the stat with, is it 75% in terms of how that reduces the duration with having that option? The percentage of your after-tax income that you can stash away, that's the all-important metric if you're looking to get to financial freedom. And so if you're able to save 75% of your after-tax income, which, you know, that's a stretch, right? Most people can't do that, and I didn't do that. But the maths are very interesting if you are able to do that then it only takes seven or eight years to go from broke to financially independent this is a good segue actually just we're introducing the topic can we talk around one of the blog posts one of your first blog posts actually that i know you advise people to read in terms of how much of a difference it makes to start saving at a young age imagine a school leaver right who leaves school after a levels age 18 and she maybe lives with her parents for a bit, gets a job, or an ordinary kind of regular average paying job. If she can save £167 per month between the age of 18 and 25, she will have saved about £15,000 in total. And if that £15,000 at age 25 is growing and compounding in a stock market tracker fund so let's say it's in an s p for a vanguard s p 500 tracker fund if that gets 10 percent a year of total return then her pot of fifteen thousand pounds by the time she's 65 is worth over a million and that's without ever having saved another penny after the age of 25 so that's the power of compound interest and you know, most people just don't understand those numbers. So when I first say those numbers to people, they say, well, you know, that's obviously wrong. And I show them the math in a spreadsheet and like, there it is. You know, you can't argue with the maths. The maths is the maths. And compound interest is a very powerful thing. You know, so clearly I talked about the power of your savings rate. That, that's really important. But the other thing that's really important is start early because that way compound interest can do more of the heavy lifting rather than earning and saving. Where does the 10% come from? So, you know, you said, if we look at the S&P 500 Vanguard fund and assuming 10%, but I know that figure is based on, I think, historic compounding over the lifetime of the stock market. Is that correct? That's roughly the average annual return that the American stock market has delivered over the last 150 years or so. So we don't know what it will generate in the future, but that's what it actually has generated over the last 150 years. So where would somebody start with this? So as we were saying just at the beginning, before we started the recording, our niche, our avatar, our executives. So these are entrepreneurs, C-suite level people in management positions. So where is a good starting point to take check and think, okay, what do I do next? Professionals and kind of successful entrepreneurs and kind of board level people you know those guys and girls have got the income element sorted so they're very focused on hard work success recognition remuneration they're all over that like a rash right so those people and in some ways that's the hardest bit of all so they've already cracked or are on the way to cracking the hardest bit of the equation so that's the good news. But the bad news, it doesn't matter how much you earn, you know, if you spend that, then you will never build wealth, okay? So what you have to do is to hold on to more of the money that comes into your life. And, you know, the, here's the problem. Most successful people, they kind of remind me of a kind of tin bucket shot full of holes, right? You pour water in and it just pours straight out that you pour money into their life and it pours straight out 
And so what those people need to do is kind of plug the leaks and start to just keep hold of a meaningful chunk of those kind of big incomes. That means lifestyle changes, okay? That means not prioritizing um, new cars, buying holiday homes, not necessarily buying the, the biggest kind of mansion that you can, et cetera, et cetera. What it really entails is thinking of yourself like a business whereby you earn as much as you can, like you maximize sales, but you cut your cost base down. And what you're interested in is maximizing the difference between those. So you're maximizing profit and you're kind of paying yourself that profit. So if somebody came to you, they've got debt, they've got a mortgage, they don't have a pension, where would be a good starting point in terms of the strategy and approach? So you just need to start to build up passive income, you know, have your money work for you. Because, you know, we're talking about, um, you know, people earning good incomes. So that, that just means kind of hanging on uh, to a, a big chunk of their kind of monthly paycheck. And once you do that, it's kind of super easy to invest on automatic pilot. So paying into a pension, um, paying into an ISA, investing in the stock market, investing in wealth generating assets that don't require your time and energy to kind of look after them they kind of grow on their own that's why you know there are two great asset classes for wealth accumulation one is property and the other is equities the beauty of equities for the people you're talking about like busy professional people is they don't require management it literally could be as simple as you buy one vanguard global all cap index fund your money is just spread around all the big companies of the world and you get on with your life you get on with kind of kicking kicking ass at in your business as ceo or as whatever you are your money is working uh while you work and it's also working while you sleep can you just give a summary to how vanguard works for people that might never heard of it and what the difference is with going down that route as opposed to a financial advisor and a different kind of fund vanguard's just um if you like the best kept secret in the world of fund management it's the only big fund management group in the world that's owned by the customers and so that stru that economic ownership structure drives all its behaviors so it, essentially it's run for cost now they do make profit but every time they kind of realize they're making too much profit they cut the fees on their products to bring it back to break even your money is not being paid to the fund manager or intermediaries or financial advisors or you know other people in kind of pinstripe suits you're keeping hold of it and it's growing and compounding prodigiously and you know, why is that so, 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 so important? You know, in that example that I mentioned earlier, where the 15,000 turns into a million at a 10% annual return over 40 years, if you're paying, say, 2% to the fund manager and your friendly neighborhood financial advisor, etc., then your gross return will be 10%, your net return will be 8%. And your £15,000 will not grow to a million pounds over 40 years. It will grow to £457,000 over that same time period. So just paying, you know, 2% a year uh, to intermediaries absolutely savages the, the pot of money that you end up with. What difference does the platform make as well? I know we've discussed this many times over the years, but can you explain that approach as well in terms of what options people might have? You can go straight to Vanguard. Um, you don't need a separate platform to buy an ISA. I use a, an online stockbroker or a platform. I mean, personally, I use the Share Center, but there's lots of others, Hargreaves, Lansdowne or iWeb, etc. It's really simple to run your own portfolio and to manage your own money. You know, I always say it's no harder to run your own pension or your, your own portfolio, your own ISA than it is to run your own online bank account. Literally, is that simple, isn't it? You select the platforms, let's say it's a share center, and you want to put X amount per month or a bulk sum or a combination of both into this fund, and that's it. You don't have to do any more thinking than that. I wrote a blog post called Investing with the Automatic Pilot, and that, that's a good mental model. In other words, if you can just you know, imagine that 
you know, you get paid at the end of the month, a bunch of that money, maybe half of that is swept to your investment account. You've got a standing instruction to the investment account to buy this particular fund. That's all happening on automatic pilot. And the funds are buying a, a very small amount of lots of different companies, which are dividend bearing companies, hence the accumulation in terms of the pot. Let's say you bought the Vanguard Global All Cap Index Fund, that's got 6,000 of the world's biggest companies in there. And so you own a bit of everything. You own the whole economy. And as those companies prosper, as they pay dividends, as they reinvest profits, as they build new factories, etc., you share in that growth. And that's where, that's where that 10% comes from. It's not some kind of, it's not some trick or some scam. You know, that comes from the growth. It comes from technological progress and, you know, human ingenuity and the fact that each year those companies get a bit better at making stuff. I guess, especially if it's 6,000 companies, it's balanced risk. It's not one company or a number of companies in one country. It's thousands of companies across lots of different countries say that a good portfolio passes the meteorite test and the meteorite test is where an asteroid kind of comes out the sky and lands somewhere on the earth's surface and if your portfolio passes the meteorite test you don't mind where it lands as long as it's not on your head so if it lands on tesco's head office well as an investor you don't mind because you also own some sainsbury's and you own some asda walmart and and all the other kind of big retailers of the world so am i right in saying you had the choice to stop working at 43. Given your time again, would you do anything differently with what you know now? The most common thing that people say to me is, if only I knew, kind of age 18, the power of compound interest. And so if I had known that, then I would have been even more kind of focused than I already was on kind of getting started in investing. And you know, I wouldn't have spent so much money, you know, so for quite a while in my 20s, uh, in my 20s in particular, when I lived in London, as I did well in my career, my lifestyle inflated up, or really, the better way to put it is my spending inflated up. Um, and, you know, a lot of that money, I didn't really get value for money from, you know, it was kind of here today, gone tomorrow. And so I kind of realized as I've got older is that, you know, buying stuff kind of feels good in the moment, but the, the buzz wears off pretty quickly. Um, and so I kind of encourage people to think about instead of buying stuff, you know, buy experiences and, and even better than buying experiences, buy your freedom. All of your articles are interesting. I know there's one particular that made me laugh about cars. Can you talk us around your definition for expensive motor cars? Yeah, well, I call them money incineration units because the bigger the car, the, the more money it burns. If you think about what you're doing, I mean, you go to a petrol station and you hand over money and they give you something that you put in the tank that you then burn. So, you know, if that ain't burning money, then it's pretty damn close. And, you know, that's fine. You know, we all need to get around. But if you just think about the, I mean, the aggregate resources of the economy that are devoted to the car industry are absolutely staggering. Um, and you just think about, you know, the classic middle class um, driveway that's got, you know, maybe a, a, an Audi and a BMW on it or something like that. That's a lot of car when you know, you can equally well get around in a Skoda or a, you know, a Ford KA or a, um, you know, a Toyota Igo or something. So that kind of forces us to think, oh, what are we getting when we buy the, the Audi and the BMW, um, et cetera? Well, really, we're getting status. There's some difference, I guess, between a BMW and a Toyota Igo. But principally, I think it's about status. And so if you can just kind of train yourself not to measure yourself in that way and kind of judge how well you're doing in life by something else, like maybe how well you're doing in your business or your career, rather than what car you're driving, well, that's a huge win from a personal finance perspective. Because, you know, if you spend 15,000 less on a car, well, that 15,000 pounds goes into your freedom fund. And that's a million quid, you know, in 40 years time compounded. 
And can you talk us around your view on swimming pools? Because that was another interesting article. I try and look at what you actually get when you buy something, okay? Um, and kind of break it down. So when you buy a Ferrari, you know, what are you getting? You know, are you really getting transportation? Not so much. You're really getting an experience and a status symbol, okay? It, similarly with swimming pools, it just it kind of made me laugh when I thought about, um, you know, the amount of money that people pay to have a swimming pool dug in the back of their garden, and, you know, and that costs whatever, 30000 or 50000 and then, and then a small fortune to run and, and heat and clean each year. It was a hot summer, so we bought a one of those swimming pools that kind of sits above ground. It costs like 80 quid, I think. And, you know, it does the job. It cools you off in the summer and it's fun to splash around in. And to be honest, how many of 50,000 pound swimming pools people are just getting in to cool off and splash around in? And it's like, well, that's 50 or whatever thousand pounds you could have just had working for you. So if this is resonating with some people and it's resonating because they know what they should be doing and they're getting on board with this. How would they get their loved one, their partner also in that frame of mind? Money is very personal. So some people just are natural spenders. Some people are natural savers. You know, the way we, met, we spend money reflects our values and our beliefs. And so one of the most powerful things you can ever do actually is just model the behavior that you want to spread and I kind of lived the examples I you know I just didn't buy stuff and that I didn't really really need to and so she sees that behavior you know the most important thing is to talk about this stuff and to make conscious mindful decisions about money rather than just kind of going along being swept along because you're just doing what everyone in your social circle is doing that's the kind of potential trap of success you tend to you know if you're a partner in a law firm you'll tend to socialize with other partners in a law firm if you're an entrepreneur you're a successful entrepreneur you'll, you'll tend to hang out with other successful entrepreneurs and if they're all buying the ferrari or the you know the top end bmw etc and you don't think about it you'll naturally emulate that it's kind of monkey see monkey do a lot of this is just bringing conscious awareness to it. Where's the balance in terms of, I guess, how much is enough and how far along the scale somebody goes in terms of investing and saving versus experience? You know, what's right for me is not right for everyone else. So that's my kind of proviso. But here's what I do know. As a society, we are very wasteful we're overvaluing the trappings of success and we're undervaluing time headspace kind of being calm being unhurried the individual's decision is very much down to them do you have any advice or insights for parents and they're thinking i'm on the route i've got a decent pension i've got a good job but i look at my daughter or son and think without major financial help, how would they ever get on housing market, for example? I mean, firstly, the most powerful thing that you can do for your children is be a role model. You can kind of, you know, give your children all the lectures in the world. But if you haven't sorted out your pension, if you have never tracked your own spending, if you haven't been regularly kind of saving, you know, on automatic pilot in the way that I talked about earlier, you know, for many years, then, you know, your children will kind of know that. Children pick stuff up, stuff that isn't explicitly verbalized. And so, you know, we all have a money blueprint. You know, your money blueprint is your set of beliefs about money. And the biggest input into that is your parents and their, their role model and your experiences growing up. And kind of in the way that I talked about that, and my parents borrowing money, that kind of taught me the, the dangers of that. You know, I sat down with my kids and ran them through that example of, the, of how 15,000 turns into a million by compound interest. You know, I took them through the spreadsheet. So you can explicitly teach them. The other thing that I just think is amazingly powerful is just encouraging them to get, you know, the, the classic kind of Saturday job, minimum wage job. 
so my son's just got a job he's just moved up in the world from being kind of washing dishes in a, in a pub to working at subway um, and so life experience is just priceless absolutely priceless for kids because the whole frame of reference for a lot of middle class people and how they think about money and their children is totally messed up because they frame it um, I'm going to be a bit rude here, kind of how you did, which is like, how how can I help on the housing ladder? And that's really the wrong way to think about it. The better way to think about it is how can I install in them a belief system or, and uh, a confidence around money that will serve them their entire life? We interviewed Dr. Aubrey de Grey. He's a longevity specialist. So he's working on not slowing down aging, but actually reversing aging so if we were able to increase the human lifespan would you do anything different i have run my life on the basis that i'm kind of going full term um, and so before we'll come on to talk about longevity extension but, but i've always kind of operated on the assumption that i'm going to make it to 80 right that's a very sensible and rational assumption for people born in the west at this point in history because infant mortality now is so low and you know and medicine is such that it's able to kind of do a, a, a really really good job at kind of keeping us ticking along all the time i see these attitudes like live for the moment you know and spend it now you can't take it with you don't be the richest man in the graveyard you know you only live once go for it you know etc and those people are essentially living as if they were going to die in six months time and as a result they end up living paycheck to paycheck and, and ironically you know that is a huge source of stress in modern day life and that sort of chronic stress is one of the things that kills people it's no doubt that that is a contributor to heart disease and a whole bunch of other kind of mod diseases of modern affluence so firstly i assume you know that i'm going to kind of stick around i'm going to be here for the long haul that's a very sensible and helpful assumption to make and and that's an assumption that most people kind of should be making i mean if you plonk me down in sierra leone in the middle of a gunfight i would behave differently you know i would kind of live for the moment a lot more but if you're playing the the hand you're dealt rationally and you're born in Basingstoke or something, you should be planning for 80 years. Um, so that would be the first part of my answer to the question. I do have an interest in kind of, you know, healthy lifespan. And so essentially the kind of problem that we have at the moment is medicine and drugs, etc. They've done a great job in, in kind of removing infectious disease and an infant mortality and kind of catching us up you know after our first heart attack and, you know by age 55 and keeping us going for another 20 years but what that's not doing is necessarily extending healthy lifespan i look around me and i see a lot of people who are alive but are not enjoying a healthy lifespan you know it, i just the number of mobility scooters in the uk is like 400,000. We could talk about the elements of how do you expand healthy lifespan. That's very settled science, okay? So things like a mobility practice, dancing, yoga, um, you know, something like that, weightlifting, those things expand healthy, healthy lifespan. Fasting, um, expands healthy lifespan um, you know and there's kind of other kind of biohacking type stuff can do which kind of all boils down to kind of removing some of the most egregiously unhealthy elements of modern life and just trying to replicate our ancestral environment a little better so you know in our ancestral environment we had no choice other than to move. In our ancestral environment, we would often have experienced food scarcity. There's no doubt you can expand your healthy lifespan, by which I mean you can spend more of the time between 0 and 80 healthy, fit and active. That doesn't mean you necessarily expand it beyond 80, then you're a kind of into the realms of you know, technological progress.
what if we could expand into say 100 or 120? Does that mean we would have to work for longer and therefore build up a larger passive income stream? Therefore, that can sustain you for longer? That's a good thing as long as your healthy lifespan is going up and you're not just spending 20 years on a life support machine. Okay, so that's a good thing. It allows you to work for longer. The beauty of financial independence is it kind of, it decouples working for longer from being forced to work longer in a job that's that's completely inappropriate for someone of that age. So, you know, for example, you know, I could see being a scaff. I could see myself being a scaffolder, you know, between the age of 20 and 40. Would I want to be a scaffolder between the age of 80 and 90? You know, probably not. So there is a natural rhythm to human life. Um, by extending that and extending healthy life, you're, that's a good thing. You're extending your options. It allows you to earn more money and it gives you more opportunity for your money to grow over that time. So it's not, you know, the framing that you see in a lot of the media is deliberately and misleadingly negative. It's like, oh my God, what a disaster. We're living longer and we're all, therefore, we're all going to like have to eat cat food. No, one doesn't follow from the other. Finally, can you talk us through the parallels between financial independence, fitness, health and well-being? There's a lot of crossover. Um, So I talk about the big three areas of life are kind of health, wealth and relationships. And a lot of the things that work in one area also work in, um, in other domains. So let's start with someone whose spending is out of control. So what would I suggest that person does? Funnily enough, I wouldn't really suggest they draw up a budget because I think of, I mean, budgets work for some people and that's fine, but I think of budgets as being a bit like New Year's resolutions or kind of fad diets. They're things that we say we're going to do and then we don't do. So people who who are kind of spending too much money, they kind of know that that's not good for their finances. For people that are eating, you know, uh, over consuming, they kind of know it. The problem is not the knowledge, it's the follow through and the compliance and so for people who are trying to get a grip on their spending what i ask them to do is for a few months track every every pound they spend okay and so that's quite easy to do you just go to your bank account at the end of each month and you can download the transactions in spreadsheet and you can look at how much you spend each month radical personal honesty so that's how i would control my spending if i was trying to cut my spending now as it happens at the moment i am trying to uh, reduce my calorie intake um, and kind of lean down a bit i'm doing kind of almost the identical or the analogous thing which is i'm keeping a food diary so i'm tracking everything that i eat and i'm just writing it down and i write it down and pin that up on a bit of paper on the fridge where i see it every day and so that is subtly but powerfully changing my behavior over time and it's bringing conscious awareness to my eating patterns or if it's um, if it's tracking your spending to your spending um, patterns and so there are loads of analogies between what works in um, in health and what works in finance and that's just one of them and how about relationships in the seven habits of highly effective people Stephen Covey talks about the gap between stimulus and response okay so we don't get to choose everything that happens in our life because we don't have control over it so that we're we're subjected to all these experiences and these stimuli Mm -hmm. We, we can't control that what we can always control is our response but what we need to do is put a gap between the stimulus and response so you can then choose the right the right thing to do now if you've got no gap between stimulus and response and an email pings into your inbox saying like champagne half price at booze world um you know if there's no gap between stimulus and response what will you do you'll click through and you'll buy the champagne and you'll have kind of um you'll have fallen into that marketeer's trap okay if you've got no gap between stimulus and response 
So equally in relationships, you know, your wife just says something that kind of, you know, that you take the wrong way, you're kind of grumpy and you're tired, etc. If if she says something that triggers you and you just give an emotional response to that and you, you know, you go off and you shout and then she shouts back and, and it escalates up. That's a failure of the gap between stimulus and response. And so, so much of what works in life is basic self-control. You know, self-control is absolutely crucial for personal finance, for kind of hanging on to your money, for investing, for thinking long term. Uh, self-control is absolutely vital for going to the gym, doing your, doing your reps, um, you know, tracking your food intake, you know, doing your whatever your mobility practices, your yoga, etc., self-control is like super 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 important for how you get on with other people nick and myself spoke about the aggregation of marginal gains in our first podcast videos i know you've talked around it again extensively on the blog can you elaborate our success in money terms is absolutely the sum total of thousands and thousands of decisions that we make through our life and so if you can kind of if you can improve your mindset and belief system so that it helps you and is supportive to building wealth then that's great because every time you make a decision your default setting is is helping you like you're more you're much more likely to make good decision after good decision after good decision and that compounds and aggregate over time massively so the classic cliche in personal finance is the kind of the latte thing whereby if you buy two lattes at starbucks a day and you're paying whatever and you know you paying five quid a pop for those or something then that's whatever however many hundred thousand pounds over a, a working life and that's a cliche because it's kind of wheeled out so often but it's true you know so those little decisions add up and they matter hugely when aggregated but you're not just aggregating those lattes remember you're compounding them as well because of the time value of money and and the effect of compound interest and how money grows in the stock market if you put you know just like the 15,000 age 25 grows to a million well equally 15p 15p age 25 compounds to a million p age 65 um, in that same way and so that's why saving 15p when you're 25 is important what did retiring at 43 give you in terms of options and opportunities how did life change and how did your mindset change just get your life back so if you've got a very full-on job as a professional or as a director or an entrepreneur, I mean, that consumes your life. So you, you ne- you're never off, essentially. You may dream about it in bed. You may you, you'll almost certainly think about it in the shower. You're, you're not just working between nine and five or even, you know, eight and eight. The no. biggest thing you get back is you get headspace. Barney, how could people reach out to you? So the, the place to go is my blog. So it's theescapeartist.me. So not .co.uk, not .com. It's www.theescapeartist.me. And finally, have you got any top tips, so three top tips for our audience, so in terms of how executives can upgrade their personal professional performance? If I went back to my 25-year-old self, I had started to suspect age 25 that a lot of spending was kind of status-related and kind of unnecessary. One of the things I'd say to my 25-year-old self is kind of back yourself, have faith in those convictions, don't get knocked off the path, don't get knocked off by peer pressure, um, you know, follow through on that because, again, back to my point of, around what works to get to financial independence, it's your savings rate. It's not how much you make, it's how much you keep and invest and put in your compounding machine. Right. Point two would be go paleo now. Don't wait till you're 40. Cut out processed carbohydrates like tomorrow. Um, you know, and I always had a balance. I'm, you know, in my 20s, I, you know, there's no shortage. I spent no shortage of money on pubs and nightclubs and stuff like that. And I wouldn't really change that. I kind of parted along the way, as it were. 
So I wouldn't even kind of cut back on something like alcohol, but just like bread and crisps and rice and donuts, it's not that much fun and it just absolutely screws up your physiology. So number one, courage your convictions with frugality. Number two, um, go paleo. And actually probably number three, I would, I would, have, uh, I would say lift weights. Thank you, Barney. I'd like to thank Barney for his time and insights. Do check out Barney on his social channels. A friendly reminder, do visit www.upgradedexecutive.com forward slash subscribe. And we will send you a special link so you can access the videos one week before we officially release them. You can follow us on all our social channels at Connect with UE and our website www.upgradedexecutive.com.